Good morning. Um, welcome to this week's episode of 17 Minutes of Science. I'm Janice Weeks, the co-founder and chief global health officer of in vivo biosystems. And it's my great pleasure to introduce today's guest, Clarice Aiello. Clarice is a quantum engineer interested in how quantum physics informs biology at the nanoscale, which I'm so excited to hear about. So Clarice is an expert on nanosensors that harness room temperature quantum effects and is interested in how quantum mechanical effects involving spin might contribute to biosensing phenomena as diverse as magnetic field detection for animal navigation, metabolic regulation in cells, and optimal electron transport in chiral biomolecules. So it's a really innovative intersection of physics and biology, and uh, we can't wait to hear more about it. Clarice did her education at the Ecole Polytechnique in France, University of Cambridge, MIT, and then did postdoc work at Berkeley and Stanford, and she's been on the UCLA faculty since 2019. And as we'll hear, Clarice's research group, the Quantum Biology Tech, or Qubit Lab at UCLA, investigates how spin physics may be involved in biosensing and its many potential applications. So welcome, Clarice. We're thrilled to have you here with us. Thank so you. So let me just, oh. I, I just need to say, Janice and Hannah, I, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for uh, your interest, and I'm looking forward to talking more. Great. So just to get things rolling, as I said, you study the intersection of physics and biology called quantum biology tech. So can you give us an overview, a description of this field? Yeah. So I like to call myself a quantum engineer. This means that I build apparatuses to study and control things that are so small and so well protected from their environment that they're better described by the laws of quantum mechanics as opposed to the laws of classical mechanics that rule everything big around us. So what does that have to do with biology, right? So um, it turns out that in, uh, so, so quantum mechanics deals with tiny little things. Uh, it can be mathematically uh, proven that if you use a quantum object as a sensor, your measurement is improved. In other words, the sensor quantumness enhances the measurement. And that's what I did in my past. I developed technological quantum sensors. Now, there's incomplete but, but very compelling evidence that organisms might, for a short time, be using the laws of quantum mechanics in order to sense their environment, in order to interact their environment. If that's true, that means that uh, they might be, be working for, again, for a short time as living quantum sensors. So what we do in our lab is to hijack instrumentation that was developed to study and control technological quantum sensors and use this instrumentation in order to, uh, at a very tiny lens scale, try to understand and uh, maybe even control those endogenous quantum mechanical knobs that might exist in nature. So that's that's what we're doing. This field, uh, this type of research is it, it exists within the field of quantum biology, which is the field that investigates the extent to which nature might be harnessing quantum mechanical laws to function. Nice. Thank you for that explanation. So <clears throat> quantum biology tech is, you know, an emerging, exciting field. And how did, and your background is in physics and engineering. So how did your interest in the biology side of this uh, develop? So I think uh, my click, my realization was, uh, was realizing that things inside cells and proteins might be working very similar ways to, to, to the, the technological quantum sensors that I worked with in the past. So in particular, I got my click uh, when I, I saw some similarities of uh, technological quantum things and things that were uh, potentially happening in biology. That's how I uh, saw it. Uh, quantum biology in general uh, is a field that has been around for about uh, 25 years, 30 years. I'm actually going to, to, to be 
to make a heresy here, some people don't like when I say this, but I think that quantum biology is maybe where quantum computing was, say, 40 years ago, mm -hmm. that there's a lot of uh, theory papers on what might be happening inside cells, and there are not many uh, experiments yet that might uh, refute or unambiguously prove that quantum mechanics plays a role in biology. So uh, in, in, in quantum computing, uh, in the beginning, there was a lot of theory. Then some people started making groundbreaking experiments and then things exploded. And now we have this booming quantum industry. Uh, my hope is that this, the same uh, will happen to quantum biology once, we, uh, once the field itself is able to unambiguously make some proofs uh, relying on some very high tech quantum inspired experiments. Yeah, so uh, along that line, I'd like you to tell us uh, some more about what your lab's working on right now, and also some sense of the equipment involved. I know when I learned quantum mechanics, I just think of these huge, gigantic instruments and, and things. So uh, how do you do your experiments? Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll get there. So my lab um, works on uh, the potential that spin physics might play a role in biology. So spin, uh, for those who, uh, have never taken quantum mechanics or who, who, who need a refresher. Uh, spin is a merely quantum property that does not have a classical equivalent. And uh, it represents how well a quantum object interacts with the magnetic field. For example, electrons have spin, some atomic nuclei have spin, and chemists and engineers usually represent spins with an arrow. So spin up, might mean a certain energy of interaction with the magnetic field. Spin down represents another energy. So different energies of interactions of that quantum object, such as an electron, with the magnetic field. Um, it turns out that it's known in basic chemistry, right? Not talking about biology yet, that there are some chemical reactions that are spin dependent. That is, if a spin at some point in the reaction is up, the chemical reaction continues through one branch. If the spin at some point in the chemical reaction is down, the reaction continues to another branch. And macroscopically, the final products of those two branches are different. So a process, a spin process of being, of being more down or more up at the top of a chemical reaction and within microseconds to nanoseconds might macroscopically alter the final products of a chemical reaction downstream and at much longer time scales. And uh, it, it turns out that magnetic fields can alter the probability of the spins being up or down. So uh, our lab is interested in understanding the extent to which magnetic fields uh, might influence chemical reactions right? And uh, the extent to which this already happens in nature. For example, um, it's known uh, without the shadow of a doubt that birds, when they migrate, they use the magnetic field of, of the earth, at least as a partial cue. And the magnetic field of the earth is orders of magnitude smaller than the magnetic field that you sense when you put your cell phone close to you. So how might they be doing this? In the beginning of the 80s, some very brave theoretical biophysicists made a, an outrageous hypothesis. They said, well, were these spin-dependent chemical reactions happening inside the birds at room temperature somehow, birds and organisms in general might sense magnetic fields to the extent that they might sense different physiological concentrations of products coming from these spin-dependent chemical reactions. At that point, this was completely outrageous because mm. uh, those finicky uh, spin-dependent chemical reactions, uh, uh, so quantum mechanics uh, is usually the stuff of very low temperatures, of, of things prepared in a vacuum, right? Uh, uh, people, uh, uh, physicists in particular, they, uh, do not uh, really associate quantum mechanics with uh, things that happen at physiological temperatures because everything that starts quantum dies classical at, at after a short time. And that's why mm -hmm. we live in a classical world. So uh, the possibility 
that uh, quantum mechanics might play a role in vivo was, uh, was crazy at that point. But now there is uh, compelling evidence in experiments with either like proteins in solution or whole organisms, whole birds, whole migrating butterflies that actually indicate that the such finicky uh, quantum process of a spin being turned up or down might actually affect physiological things such as organismal migration. Wow, that's just amazing. And I love how these totally off the wall hypotheses, you know, when they first come out, people think they're crazy and then yes. it comes to pass. Sometimes it doesn't, but yes. uh, this field has certainly it, it, been validated. If I can make a, 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 another comment sure. to, to address your question of what we do in the lab. Right? Yeah. So right now, there's a lot of evidence uh, that this is this that spin physics might uh, be relevant for, for uh, biology at two different length scales. There's a lot of evidence uh, at the level of spins inside proteins with proteins in the test tube that are unambiguous that those proteins are acting for a short time as living quantum sensors. Mm -hmm. But the next step in the land scales are for experiments with birds. When birds, uh, during migration season, people put birds in cages and want to see which way the birds go out and then they mess up with magnetic fields and the birds go to a different direction. But there's nothing in between, right? It's very hard to say that, well, the bird is, is behaving this way because of this quantum process that is proven at the level of protein. So what we do in our lab is try to bridge those two landscapes. We want to go like from bottom up and try to do quantum inspired experiments with say proteins inside a single cells and then a couple of cells and then going to the tissue level. Uh, so to cut the long story short, what we have in our lab are glorified microscopes to see the cells, to see the proteins with coils. And the coils are the ones huh. that uh, shift this can shift the spins up and down to 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 uh, change the balance of chemical reactions. Wow, I would love to see that. Um, so one thing I, I mean, I'm a biologist at heart, and I just love that these effects are implicated in say animal behavior and things like that. And I think just on their own, that's so interesting and valuable to know that that why would we need more? But you know, we always need to look for applications and uh, you know how this can be expanded out uh, more broadly. So uh, what what are you working on or what are the opportunities for applications of this yes. knowledge? So I think there are two main applications of uh, this of our research. The first is more technological, right? Uh, if nature is using quantum mechanics to function, it knows darn well how to deal with noise, right? Because uh, mm -hmm. light happens at, at room temperature. So uh, I think technologically, I'm not saying let's replace Google's beautiful quantum computer with a molecule, but can we learn with nature strategies on how to deal with noise and then apply on top of Techno quantum technologies, right? That's one side of things. The other side that I find is extremely exciting is, it's not going to happen in 10 years, 20 years, but maybe in 30, 50 years, can we learn to control quantum mechanical degrees of freedom in biology to sort of shift physiological behaviors, right? For example, mm -hmm. uh, there's evidence now that the production of reactive oxygen species is mediated by magnetic field in a way that is consistent with the spin model, right? So can we learn how to apply systematically, oh, a certain magnetic field strength or frequency in order to drive physiological process uh, related to disease or related to other physiological pathways that might have those spin dependent chemical reactions? Um, right, I have a question that actually is not on the list, but so, you know, we there are magnetic fields all around us, both from the earth and other devices. I mean, what, what's known about the possible interaction of those exogenous sources or potentially disrupting, you know, what's supposed to be happening biologically? It's, it's not known much. And I'm a, a huge advocate, advocate for more research in this field, right? In particular, for reasons that I, I won't go in, this particular process that I describe it to you, the, the spin dependent chemical reactions, it's the stuff of low magnetic field uh, intensities. 
right, in the sense that this particular phenomena is not going to happen inside a, a, an MRI machine, mm -hmm. but it's going mm -hmm. to happen at magnetic fields close to the strength of the Earth, close to the strength of, of this guy. So I'm not saying to anyone to be to be afraid of your paranoid devices, of... <laughs> paranoid, uh -huh. but I really think that there's a lot of research that should be done and should be funded to uh, deal with the effect of those small magnetic fields that we're in contact with all around us. Um, let's see, we have ooh, three minutes left. Wow, time goes so quickly. Um, so yeah, so your lab at UCLA is the only qubit lab in the US, but you've obviously studied in a number of locate countries and all over the world. So what's the state of this field uh, around the world as well as your own lab? Yes. So uh, the US has been a little bit uh, behind the field of quantum biology. Uh, there have been uh, quantum biology centers uh, in the UK, uh, in Germany, in Japan, in Korea, in Denmark now. So th there hasn't been a lot of, of, of activity in quantum biology uh, in the US, apart from some uh, disjoint efforts, right? So I'm happy to say that actually it's official as of today. We are launching out of UCLA, the first US-based quantum biology center. And the mission of the center and, and director is going to be to educate people on this field and actually build community, strengthen the community so that we can bring a quantum biology to the mainstream, right? To, to encourage uh, young talent to come into this area, to encourage funding agencies to start looking at those issues. So I'm very excited that, that we're starting a new journey here. And that by, I mean, in that field, I mean, you're presumably working and recruiting physicists and engineers and biologists, chemists. Yes. Uh, all of those areas. So it's like this incredible mishmash of, of yes. uh, intersection, that, that's intersections both a, of fields. Yes, that's both a challenge and what I like about my work, <laughs> uh -huh. because we need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable because no one knows huh. everything, right? So I'm learning all the time. I'm teaching all the time. So I think uh, it, it's a very interesting uh, field of, of, of research. Interdisciplinary science is, is something that is that I think is going to drive science forwards in the near future. All right, we have uh, ooh, a little over a minute. So instead of me asking you something, why don't wait, is there anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to get out to our audience? Yes, I would like to encourage everyone out there to be curious, to remain curious. And the other thing is, if you can, try to learn a little bit about quantum mechanics. I think quantum mechanics uh, is, uh, actually we already live in a quantum world, right? So a little bit of knowledge in, uh, about quantum mechanics uh, goes a long way and helps you understand a lot of technologies that, that we are already familiar with. And, and it's fun, it's very fun. Oh, so I hope it sounds so. super fun. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, on that note, um, let me just stop my, phone so it doesn't buzz. Um, Clarice, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day and lab to spend these 17 minutes with us. It's been a thrill. I, I haven't thought about quantum mechanics for a long time and now I will. So uh, thanks so much and all the best with your work and congrats on the new center. That's awesome. And so we'll look for more great things coming from, from your group. Uh, thank you. And worldwide. And super pleasure to be here in seven minutes of science. Thank you, Janice, for, for your time and Hannah for organizing this and all, all the people in the background. Thank you all. Yeah. And, and may the quantum be with you. May the quantum be with you. Yes. The, I, I need a little arrow, but yes. Um, huh, exactly. Okay. Well, everybody, thanks again, Clarice. Thanks all of you who are out there uh, watching us live. And let me just remind you, we'll be back on the air in two weeks with another episode of 17 Minutes of Science.